um, as I was listening to these other uh, other presenters and I was kind of looking at the lineup, I, I realized that um, I was I was screwed in a way because um, <laughs> I'm I'm looking out over the audience and I see um, you know we've we've got a, a a group of biologists, wonderful people that have this experience with wolves uh, and and landscapes that they're involved in, and then we've got this group of social scientists, and I'm thinking. You guys could say anything you want, and these guys will mostly accept that as the reality, but, but I have all of the people that are nit will be able to nitpick everything I say are sitting in the audience right now. So I'm feeling a little bit of pressure. Um, uh, with, with that said, what I want to do very briefly, there are, there are several lines. We talk about tolerance for wildlife. There are actually several lines of research that involve uh, uh, calculating tolerance and, and conceptualizing tolerance. And um, what I'm going to do today is I, I, don't have, uh, I don't have nearly enough time to actually cover all those lines. So I'm going to just uh, do kind of a deep dive into attitudes toward wolves. And, um, and what I want to do is, is I want to be that champion for reality from a social science standpoint and test some of the assumptions that we often make in the management community concerning uh, what, what it means to live with wolves. So with that introduction. Um, so we assume, we often take for granted now in the large carnivore conservation community that tolerance is a prerequisite for large carnivore conservation. It is, it is the baseline of what we need. And this has uh, pervaded not just the academic literature, but it's, it's in the management literature as well. I now see it written into final rules that the US Fish and Wildlife Service publishes for, for grizzly bears or for gray wolves, right? So here's one academic example. But what I find is we often mean different things when we say wolves, so I'm, or when we say tolerance. Uh, we, mean, we, we mean different things when we say wolves as well, but um, when we say tolerance, I'm, I'm trained as a social scientist, and so a lot of, and, and, and more, I'm trained as a psychologist, really, and when we say uh, things like tolerance, it evokes uh, tolerance for a diverse community, so attitudinal prejudices, for example, or discriminatory types of behaviors. Uh, we don't use the terms quite that way um, when we talk about wildlife, but it's a, it's a useful analog. But when I talk to my ecologist friends, uh, what they say is, we don't care what people's attitudes are, Jeremy. We, we just don't, we need them to not shoot wolves. And, and in fact, even if they're shooting at wolves, if they don't, if they don't hit them, that's fine. You know, it's, it's all about the outcomes, right? If you don't affect the population, the viability or the distribution of the, that animal species, that's fine, doesn't matter. We don't need tolerance. So, and then when I talk to folks in the management community, they, I think they mean something entirely different. So what I get the sense of when I talk with folks in the, in the management community is tolerance means I want people to stop yelling at me. <laughs> um, it's, it has nothing to do with attitudes toward critters. Just get those people to stop yelling at me, okay? So we've got very different uh, lines of research heading in different directions when we talk about tolerance. Here's an example of one of those assumptions and something that I, I would like to start to be the champion for reality here. Um, so it has been uh, said, I, I think, since I've, I've been involved in this uh, area of research that we've, we've made the assumption that attitudes toward wolves are changing. We don't always agree on how they're changing. Um, usually it's said in the context um, like this, which was in the 2009 final rule issued by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that ulti ultimately was made law by Congress when they attached a budget rider uh, to uh, a defense bill in 2011. Uh, public attitudes toward wolves have improved greatly in the past 30 years. So this happens in 2009, and about that time I was, I was working at Ohio State University, and I'd recently, fairly recently, published a manuscript that I worked on in my master's degree looking at Utah residents' attitudes toward wolves. And, and here, these were, the, these were the studies that were in the published literature at the time on attitudes toward wolves that looked at attitudes over time. There was a, a meta-analysis by uh, Williams et al. that was published in 2002. That little symbol at the end there, um, what that means is they didn't find any change. They concluded that there had been no change over the 30-year time period. Uh, there was a study in Sweden um, that looked at hunters in the general public, and they found that while attitudes of the general public had become more positive, the attitudes of hunters had become more negative. And then there was a study that I've conducted um, that looked at Utahns. Well, you might say that if you know the situation, you might think that's sort of strange because Utah didn't have wolves at the time. 
um, and it didn't have them in two th or didn't have them in 1994 when they conducted the first study. But we were on the border, basically, of the Rocky Mountain uh, Rocky Mountain Wolf population, and we expected them to come. They're still not there in, in any numbers that we can count. So, um, and we found that there was no change in, in residents' attitudes, whether we looked at urban residents or rural residents or hunters. It didn't matter. And subsequently, a whole variety of studies have been published. So shortly after that, a study in Croatia, this, this used a little bit more um, sophisticated technique. They actually looked at the same individuals over time, and they found that those individuals living in Wolf's Range in Croatia had become more neutral. And then there was a study in Wisconsin looking in, within Wolf's Range, and they found people had become more negative. Another study in Sweden and within Wolf Bear Range found people had become more negative. And then uh, a meta-analysis published in 2015 found that uh, folks in Europe had become uh, more negative, but it was, it was a small effect. Um, finally, there was another follow-up study to the study in Wisconsin, and they found that um, they actually differentiated between uh, men and women in the study, and they found that while men had become more negative toward wolves, women were significantly more positive in that sample. Again, this was a, st this was a study that looked at the same individuals over time. So uh, we got the idea that um, we, the first and only national study that had looked at attitudes toward wolves was conducted by Stephen Kellert in 1978. And so we replicated his measures. We put them into a survey in, in 2014. And, and here's what we found. We found that from 1978 to 2014, uh, the proportion of people that expressed positive attitudes toward wolves had increased by 43%. It was a rel relatively dramatic uh, effect. So, so this, um, to my knowledge, in the peer-reviewed literature, this is the extent of, of studies that have looked at attitudes toward wolves over time. And it doesn't paint a very easy to tell picture. So I, I was talking with John Busevich um, as I was showing this slide and I said, I, what are my take home messages from this slide? You know, how do you, how do you summarize this? And I think I can give you a couple quick take homes. Tentatively, I think we can say that attitudes toward wolves have become more positive among the general public. Okay, this is what we found in our study uh, in, among the general public. It's also what they found in, in Sweden among the general public. But I think those, those places where wolves are, those, those small places where wolves are, and especially among male hunters, um, we can say undoubtedly that those areas, we have very good evidence to suggest that those people have become more negative. And this is what we know right now about attitudes toward wolves. So we'll come back to this, we'll circle back, but I want to address a couple other claims that I, that I hear commonly. So one of those claims is that uh, prolonged protection of wolves under the ESA creates uh, resentment for wolves and cr can create resentment for the act, the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the people that manage wolves. Um, and this was expressed actually in a letter to then Secretary of Interior Sally Jewell um, that uh, was penned by Dr. Dave Meach and colleagues uh, issued in 2015. So you see the quote there. Um, and we also hear, we heard this even last night. So we hear that, um, in fact, we expect there to be more tolerance for recolonizing wolves than reintroduced wolves. And so this is a good reason why we should just maybe let them come. So I wanna address this with data. And we actually collected data with these kinds of ideas in mind. So in that 2014 study that I mentioned, we actually sampled three different regions of the country. We sampled uh, the Northern Mo Rocky Mountain DPS, the distinct population segment as defined by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. That's the area in blue you see up there. We sampled uh, the area in red, which is the Western Great Lakes distinct population segment. And we sampled the rest of the country as one big block. And, and as, as folks noted yesterday, the Northern Rockies and the Western Great Lakes have some real distinct features that separate them, right? So uh, wolves in, in the Northern Rocky Mountains were reintroduced in the mid-1990s. They, they did not recover naturally as they did with the Western Great Lakes. Uh, wolf habitat in the, in the Northern Rockies is different. Um, it's predominantly on public lands. In fact, there was a wonderful, um, did anybody see the National Geographic article that was out like maybe 2010? They mapped, the, uh, they showed every location of a wolf pack and, pack and they had public land. And nearly every dot that they had, there's like 200 dots on the map, nearly every one of them was on public land, right? Um, so wolves in the Northern Rocky Mountains are in high altitude uh, places that have lower precip, 
Um, the agriculture there is, is predominantly ranching on public lands. That's a, it's a very different practice than ranching uh, cattle in the east, right? So for all these reasons, these areas were different, and, and we might hypothesize that attitudes would differ, that tolerance would differ. So I, I suggested before that um, a, as a psychologist, I, I think about attitudes and behavior as, as separate things. So psychologists also make distinctions that are often lost upon the management community between things like behavioral intentions and actual behaviors. So what this, this is my, I, my one really data heavy, heavy slide, I apologize for that. So what this is, is this is um, a list of a whole bunch of factors that in previous studies, sociodemographic factors have been correlated with attitudes toward wolves. And it is a measure of attitudes in the first column, uh, a measure of prior behavior. This is supportive uh, behavior, advocacy behavior, minus their um, uh, oppositional advocacy behavior, if you will. Uh, an index of behavioral intentions, which is the same thing. So this is the expressed intentions to engage in advocacy that is either pro-wolf or anti-wolf. And then we have the measure of the wildlife acceptance capacity. Folks in the management community are usually pretty familiar with that measure. And this just asks people if they want the population to go up or down in their state. And then that last column shows their average uh, absolute correlation across those measures. And you don't see really anything compelling. If, if there's a takeaway from this slide, right, it's that most of these factors are, are weakly correlated um, with all four measures of tolerance. Although at least, at least we see consistency across those measures. And the best predictors I've, I've made bold, the best predictors there are the extent to which people identify with, with various types of groups, advocacy groups, whether they identify as a farmer or a rancher or they identify as an environmentalist. So what did we find in the study? We looked at attitudes uh, toward gray wolves uh, across these regions and what we see. Um, anyone have a drum roll? Can I get a drum roll? <laughs> Kidding. Um, so what we see, what we found are no significant differences across these regions. Um, so I'm showing the United States in general there, but the tests were actually performed with the rest of the country region. Uh, the regions didn't differ um, when we ran a chi-square on them. They didn't differ when we treated them as means and we, and we looked at t-tests as, or ANOVAs as well. Uh, what's more is that the claim, uh, I, I mentioned the claim, right, that, um, that support for wolves or, or prolonged protection of wolves might actually lead to a decline in support for the ESA. So here are the four known studies that we could find that looked at support for the ESA, which included our 2014 study. And there are no significant differences in support, um, but if we ran a chi-square solely on opposition, we'd find that in these studies, opposition appears to be declining slightly over time. Op that is opposition to the Endangered Species Act. What we see across those studies is roughly four in five Americans supports the ESA. Moreover, subsequent evaluations indicated no regional differences in support, not just support for the ESA, but trust in the US Fish and Wildlife Service, intentions to engage in any sort of oppositional advocacy, so intolerance, if you will, in that regard, prior oppositional advocacy, nor that WAC measure, that pre preference for the wolf population to go up or down. And so some of you may be rejecting this information, or it, those of you that are less skeptical may be saying, why, why did you find that? And one of the reasons may be that people's experiences with wolves are interpreted through these social networks, right? Through the social groups that we belong to. The strongest factors that were correlated with those attitudes were my identity with these social groups, okay? And the people that belong to the groups that are negative are relatively few in number, right? So hunters, five to six percent of Americans currently hunt. The ranching community, I can't even fathom to guess. I know that less than 2% of the US population is involved in agriculture at all. I don't even fathom a guess at what, who is involved in, in ranching. These represent tiny fractions of their overall population, right? Ed Bangs used to say, we reintroduced wolves. Ed, Ed was, for those who didn't know him, Ed was the Northern Rocky Mountain Wolf Re court, uh, Re Recovery Coordinator. And he used to say that we put wolves in the most godforsaken place. Right? These high altitude parks like Yellowstone National Park or, or the Central Idaho Wilderness, there are not a lot of people there, folks. Right? So for, for those of us that expect wolves to have these direct negative experiences with people, that it, they may just be drowned out in our sample. And so we took one more test. So this is one more look. This was not published in the 2018 paper that ultimately came out. 
So I've, now what I've done here is I've actually looked at the intention to, uh, well actually we looked at a variety of measures, but we just sorted out the hunters, people who identified strongly as hunters, and we ran the same sets of tests. And we see there's no significant differences in trust for the US Fish and Wildlife Service across those regions among hunters. Uh, no significant differences in their attitudes toward the ESA, nor in their, um, in their prior self-reports of intolerance. But there was a significant difference in their intention to engage in oppositional advocacy. And we did find that the people who were in that rest of the country region, that those people uh, wanted to have more wolves. Now, that might make sense since most of those places don't have any wolves, right? So what does all this mean or, or how, how might we interpret this? I think I'm not trying to tell you that place doesn't matter. Place matters. It shapes our experiences, but those experiences are also interpreted through our social groups, okay? Having wolves in the Northern Rockies or putting wolves in Colorado, that is gonna be a, lead to a very different experience for somebody who strongly identif identifies as an environmentalist as, a pair, as opposed to someone who strongly identifies or participates in a ranching community, right? These are very different things. So I'll, I'll, I see that I'm running out of time, so um, I wanna leave you with one other thought about the centrality of, of the tolerance construct. So I put this together um, uh, about a week ago thinking about the programs that we need to create and the assumptions that we often make regarding how important tolerance is um, to the recovery of wolves and other large carnivores. And as I started to put it together, I said, it's, it sits in the dead center. It's important to all aspects of management. If we wanna have these animals on the landscape, we need people, we don't necessarily need them to like wolves, but we do need them to stop killing them. And that's all I've got.